Greetings, folks. Professor Fiore back one more time to help you with your electronics and circuit theory. Today, we're going to look at part two of our series on DMMs, digital multimeters. In part one, we looked at the accuracy spec for a DMM. In part two, we're going to look at something called loading effects. All right, so here's my sort of generic little digital multimeter, little three and a half digit device. I'm going to use this with these probes to measure various DC voltages in my circuit. All right, so we'll start off with something relatively straightforward. I'll just get a little power supply, a little DC voltage source. Let's say that's 12 volts. And I put a couple of resistors on it. It's a simple little series loop. All right. And I'm going to make them the same value. I'm going to say this is a 1K ohm resistor. And this is a 1K ohm resistor. Now, there's different ways you can solve this circuit. Now, you could sum up the total resistance, 2K ohms, divide into the 12 volts. It'll get you 6 milliamps. Then you can use Ohm's law. 6 milliamps times 1K gets you 6 volts. Same thing across the other one, 6 volts. Right? Or you could use voltage divider rule. Right? Take your total voltage, multiply it by the ratio of resistances. In other words, the resistance you're interested in, let's say it's this one, divided by the total resistance. So that would be 12 volts times 1K over the total 2K. Right? That's one half, obviously. So half of 12, 6 volts. So I expect to see across each of these 6 volts DC. And if you build this circuit in lab, right, and you get your meter, how's this for sort of a mixed thing, right? A schematic with a real meter. But I take this and I you know, go across my lower resistor. And by the way, note the polarity, red lead on top here, plus my meter is going to read 6 volts. And if I come over here and I do likewise on this one, same thing. My meter is going to read 6 volts. And I can play with this all day. I can put in a you know, pair of 2.2Ks, a pair of 12Ks, a pair of 15Ks, 33Ks, you know, uh, 750 ohms each, and so on and so forth. And it's always going to work out to this because it's a simple one-to-one -one voltage divider, right? And obviously, if we put different values in there, you know, it'll divide up differently. You can go in lab. This is a really nice sort of exercise to show how a series work, a series circuit works to verify things like the voltage divider rule, right? You can just put different values in here, different voltages, go through, measure, 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 compare it to your theoretical values, you know, and it works out really well. The reality of the situation is that this meter will subtly alter the circuit itself. To do the measurement, when you put these leads across, a small amount of current is actually going to flow through the meter instead of flowing through the resistor. And that is going to affect the measurement. Right? If you don't have the full current flowing through this, uh, this lower resistor, then obviously you're not going to get that same voltage. If a small piece of it's being tapped off, the trick is that small current that's being tapped off is so small that for the most part we can ignore it. It's typically smaller than the inaccuracy that we get off of this meter. All right? Now the way that a manufacturer will sort of clue you in on this, when it comes to voltage measurements, they'll say this meter has a certain internal resistance. So we think of the meter as being a resistance. A lot of sort of general purpose three and a half digit DMMs have an internal resistance maybe around a mega ohm. So you think of that meter, right? I take the meter, say, well, let's use a different color. Um, I take that meter and I stick it out here. All right, put my leads on here. But what that looks like electrically is another resistor. And that might be a mega ohm, like a one mega ohm resistor. Okay, I'm not saying there's literally a mega ohm resistor in there, but that's the equivalent of it as far as the current draw. 
So when you think of the current that's coming down, right, exiting out here, at this point, a little bit of the current's going this way and some current's going this way. Now, if you think in terms of the sizes of these resistors, right, this 1K is a thousand times smaller than this one meg. Well, to get the same voltage, then this thing would have one one thousandth the current, right? This is a, basically a parallel circuit. So this voltage is six, this voltage is six, right? The meter reads six, this thing is six, six and six. If that resistance is a thousand times bigger than the current through, it's got to be a thousand times smaller. Well, that's, you know, way down. That's, like I said, probably below the resolution of the meter. But we can imagine circuits where things sort of go awry, right? Things get a little funky. So let's get rid of our 1K resistors. You know, on paper, we can put any equal valued pair of resistors on here and still get six and six, right? So if I had, you know, a, a one mega ohm resistor here and a one mega ohm resistor here, on paper, I'm still going to get six volts and six volts. But when I go into the lab and I take my meter and I stick the meter across here, I might not get anything like that. As a matter of fact, if I'm using this meter that has a one mega ohm internal resistance, when I go and measure the voltage across this lower resistor, we're not going to read six, we're going to read like four. Four volts instead of six volts. Now immediately you might think, hey, there's something a little wacky, right, with my meter perhaps, or maybe the resistor is out of tolerance. So, you know, I'll go and measure the resistor. And of course, the resistor will, you know, hopefully measure with intolerance. And I might now take my meter and put it across the upper one meg. Because Kirchhoff's voltage law would say sum of rises, right? Here's our rise, must equal the sum of the drops. So this voltage plus this voltage has to equal 12. But if you now pick up your meter leads, take them off this one, and you put them on this one, guess what? you're not going to read the difference 8 volts. You will, in fact, read 4 volts. So how is it that you get 4 volts and 4 volts, but you pick up your meter and put it across the power supply, and it's still 12 volts? Well, you know, last I checked, 4 plus 4 is 8, and 8 is not equal to 12. Where'd the other 4 go? All right. Well, what ends up happening is this loading effect. You can no longer ignore it because now you have the meter out here, which looks like, in this case, a one mega ohm resistor. Well, if these two values are equal, then they must get the same current. They have the same voltage. They must get the same current. So all the current that was flowing through here now splits in half. This thing only gets half and this gets the other half. And the result, this voltage drops down. So the one meg and in, in the, in the meter, this parallel combination, actually looks like half a meg. It looks like 500K. And now if you did a voltage divider between a one meg and a 500K, well, guess what? You'd come up with four volts. Now when you turn around and you put the meter across the upper resistor, the same thing happens. Right? I get rid of this, I put the meter on top, and that also looks like a 1 meg. So now this combo looks like 500k, a half a meg, and now the current coming out of here splits part this way, part this way, then they recombine, the two currents recombine, and the value in the lower resistor is the same as what was coming out of the power supply. So what ends up happening is that looks like 500k. We can do a divider again between a 1 meg and a 500 and guess what? 4 volts. It's kind of wacky. So you didn't really lose anything. What happened is the meter itself altered the circuit. Okay? So we have to be aware of that. Now, just to make things even more fun, 
If you took a second meter and you stuck it across this other resistor, what do you think happens? Well, now it's one mega in parallel to one mega over here, a one mega in parallel to one mega over here. So these two things become equal again. And you will measure six volts and six volts. It's kind of funny in a way. If you did not use identical meters, you might not get that. So if I use the second meter, maybe its internal resistance, instead of being one mega ohm, was 10 mega ohms, then this combo is only going to look like, you know, one mega in parallel with a 10 mega is going to be around 900K. So you're going to have 900K and, and uh, you know, a 500 combo up here. So you're not going to see, um, see this thing split out with exactly four and four. It's going to be a little off of that, okay? But it's not going to be six and six either. And maybe you grab a meter and the internal resistance is 5 mag instead of 10, instead of 1. Again, it's going to change. So if you're not aware of this loading effect and you're using high-valued resistors in the circuit, you know, you could, you could go crazy trying to figure out what's going on. Because you keep taking these measurements, they keep changing. You get a different meter and you get different results. And pretty soon you start thinking, you start assuming that, you know, all of your meters are suspect. Okay? It's not. It's the limitation of the meter. Now, the same thing will happen on current, but it's sort of a, a mirror image. When we measure current, the problem is not with really big resistances. It's with really small resistances. Because when I throw a, a, a meter in here to measure current, remember, current is in series. It's in line, whereas voltage is a difference. It's across. So if I take the, the uh, DMM and I set up as an ammeter, it's set up like this, right? It's in series. So the current that flows through here, flows through here, flows through the meter, back to the power supply. Now the question is, what's the internal, of the, uh, internal resistance of the meter on a current scale when it's acting as an ammeter instead of a voltmeter? Here you want the internal resistance to be as low as possible, right? For a voltmeter, you want it to be as big as possible so you don't get that splitting of current. Here, in the, in the case of the ammeter, you want the internal resistance to be as small as possible because otherwise it's going to create a little voltage divider with the other items. In other words, there's extra resistance that reduces the overall current and that will upset the voltages. Some of the voltage will actually drop across the meter itself. So you want something as small as possible. So we wouldn't see an effect here with like mega ohm resistance, k ohm resistance. We would see an effect if maybe I had uh, you know, something like, you know, a 10 ohm resistor and a 10 ohm resistor, right? You know, if the internal resistance on this is a couple of ohms, right, I got 10 and 10, that's 20. If that's 2 ohms, that's 10%, right? That's 10% of the total resistance. So that's going to throw off the uh, measured current by roughly 10%, just because of meter loading. I get a different meter. Maybe its internal resistance is only half an ohm. I'm going to be that much closer. Right? So ideally, we want voltmeters to have an infinite internal resistance. We want ammeters to have zero internal resistance. That's the idealization. Right? One way of sort of remembering that is that the meters, the internal resistance of the meter is essentially the exact opposite of what the ideal internal resistance of the source is. You know, an ideal voltage source has a zero ohm internal resistance. An ideal current source has an infinite internal resistance. So the meters are the exact opposite of that, right? For minimum effect, right? For minimum effect on the circuit. So we can sum this whole thing up and say, when I take a measurement, I have this sort of error window, this, this sort of span of ambiguity almost based on the accuracy of the meter. And that's a function of how many digits is it? Right? What's its resolution? Three and a half digit, maybe three and three quarter digit, four and a half digit. What is it? What's the base accuracy percentage of reading? And then the plus and minus counts, which is a resolution derived value. We have that. Then we have this secondary thing, the possibility of loading. Right? If the resistance of the meter, if the internal resistance is a sizable fraction of the resistances that are surrounding it, or the voltage that it's reading across, or what's in series as you're reading a current, then that pushes off the accuracy of our measurements as well. 
So you need to consider both of these things in order to determine just how accurate your readings are. All right. One final thing I'm going to mention here, which is that when you go into lab, it's generally a good idea. You know, if you have resistors out here, you go over to a bin, let's say, let's say you need a, um, just to throw a number out, right? You have a 750 ohm resistor. That's what I need. So you go over to the bin, you grab a 750 ohm resistor, and maybe it's a 10% tolerance resistor, right? So, you know, silver, silver final band. Well, all right, plus and minus 10%. Well, plus and minus 10% of 750 is plus and minus 75 ohms. So you're saying if it's within spec, right, it can be as big as 750 plus 75. In other words, 825. On the small end, it could be as, as small as 750 minus 75, right, or 675. So when you go in to do your measurements, you're not going to use this in your theoretical calculation, right? Why do that if you have a meter, right? If I have a meter that can measure that resistance to within 1%, let's say, I'll use that for my theoretical calculation. Why? It's not perfect, right? I mean, it's, you know, we've got this 1% accuracy or inaccuracy, however you want to look at that. But 1% of this is only 7.5 ohms. So my error window has collapsed down that much more. Now it's 750, you know, plus or minus seven and a half is a way of looking at it. You don't know what the value is. If you, if you use the nominal value, the printed value, you know, it's 750 plus or minus 75. If you actually measure it and the meter says, just for argument's sake, right, let's say it actually says that the value is, uh, you know, 720 ohms. Well, it's 720 plus or minus the accuracy of the meter, and let's just say that's 1%, so that's plus or minus 7.2 ohms, right? So your error window, you know, now you're looking at, you know, 7.2 ohms up is uh, 727, right, 0.2, and then going down, it's just about, uh, you know, uh, 713, right, 712.8. Um, so that's a lot better, right? That sort of uncertainty is much narrower, uh, much smaller uncertainty than if you just use the nominal value. So no, the meter is not going to tell you the exact value of the resistor, but it's going to improve things considerably. Now, the only time you wouldn't do that is if you had high precision, high spec uh, resistors in this case, where the precision was better than the meter. So if I had some you know, high precision, like 0.1% metal film resistors, I would use their nominal value instead of measuring them, because that's more accurate than the meter is, right? Granted, it's possible that one of these things could be bad, you know, right out of the factory, and I might want to double check it, but, you know, I would use that, you know, four or five digit uh, nominal value rather than use the meter. But normally that's not going to be the case, right? In a typical lab, you're going to be using maybe five and 10% tolerance resistors. Your meter is going to be more accurate than that. So you're going to use the meter to measure the values rather than use the nominal value. That just makes perfect sense. Okay. All right. So now we have a much better idea of how to use our DMM accurately, and that's the key. See you next time.